Good afternoon. My name is Demarcus Lewis, and statistics said that I would fail. Well, this is my journey. As I reflect on my childhood, I feel that I hadn't always had the brightest of days. I feel that most of my childhood, if not all of it, has been overshadowed by the harsh realities of losing both parents to either the penal system or drastic stages of HIV and eventually AIDS. <clears throat> so I know all too well the feeling of not having that father figure around or not having that father-son relationship. <clears throat> I know that that feeling that I thought I drastically needed, I, I no longer need. <clears throat> the only memories I have of my father is that where me and my sister would go and visit him while he was incarcerated. Maybe two or three times over the span of 10 years. Perhaps not having his relationship or their father-son relationship that I thought I needed was best for me. It allowed me to gain a closeness with my mother that is unbreakable. My mother was my everything. She was the one person I felt most comfortable with. Um, she was my hero and she was the strongest woman I'd ever known. Though she appeared so strong, it was apparent to me that she was extremely ill. Yet no matter how sick she had gotten, I always knew she would get better because see, she bounced back so well. She taught me that no matter what life throws at you, I have the option to either adapt to it or change it, but never succeed to the circumstances. As she taught me these lessons, she continually to physically take, pay a price. I remember spending an endless, endless time in the hospital believing that blood transfusions were a part of routine checkups or that freaking red dots that appeared on her arms and legs were normal. As time went on, my mother's health rapidly began to decline. By the summer after my third grade year, she was placed on hospice. About a month later, as I returned from visiting family members, I returned two days later and I remember walking into the, the house. I remember walking to the back of the room where my mother was, hoping to see her, believing that I would see her there laying in the bed, as she always did. Non-responsive though, but she would be there. But only this time she wasn't. I walked into an empty room. The bed had been made up and a fresh scent had been brought in. By this time, I'm asking myself, where's my mother at? As I began to walk back to the living area, I noticed there, there are no TVs on. There's no music playing, and my grandfather is standing there with his head down, taking deep, steady, slow breaths. Something isn't right, I tell myself. As I look in my sister's eyes, I see just a storm of tears beginning to form in her eyes. Once again, I'm telling myself just something isn't right. At this time, a, a friend of the family was present, and she began speaking the words, Mama's gone, and she reached a hug me, to comfort me at this time. See, at this time, this is when confusion starts to set in. Because I, I, I'm, selfishly, I'm selfishly asking myself, well, where do I go from here? What, what, what do I do next? What, what is next for my life? Because as I said earlier, my mother, she was my everything. She was, she was the rhythm to my heartbeat. So when I lost her, in a sense, I became heartless. I was afraid to love and perhaps even more afraid to be loved. At this time, this is when anger started to build up and I started to have behavior problems through elementary. Mind you, I was only nine when she passed away, so learning to cope, I, I wasn't successful at it. <clears throat> I began having these behavior problems mainly because I felt like I was on my own. I felt like I knew it all and no one could tell me anything. Though I know now that that is not all true. To describe this time of my life, I use the expression hopping off the porch. Similar to when a bird leaves the nest, only I wasn't forced to. I was out searching for direction. I was hanging with those who were in my neighborhood and those who were in the area I grew up in who had already fallen through the cracks. Well, 
Luckily for me, in eighth grade, my principal, I had a principal who cared, Mr. Ron Griffin. I remember him, I remember being, I had been sent out of class. Well, not sent out, but requested out of class. <laughs> I did have behavior problems, but at that time I had got requested out of class. <laughs> and I, I, I met Mr. Griffin in the cafeteria with the counselor, and, and she stood describing what Abbott was and what Abbott could do and how we could benefit from Abbott if we decided to join the next year, my freshman year in high school. Well, at that time, I didn't take it seriously. Of course, I joined it because Mr. Griffin had brought me in and a couple of other kids were, were joining, so I'm like, you know, join it. And they also said that, you know, you could do your homework in this class or it would kind of be like a down, just a, a way to get away from the reality of regular high school life. So I'm like, oh, well, any kind of downtime, I'm with it. So, <laughs> so, so I signed up, so I, I, I signed up, not knowing what I got myself into. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I, I reached a point where I, I, I no longer wanted to be a part of Abbott. It, I, I was ready just to be done with it. I was ready to give up. Uh, I was tired of, of having to be, I was tired of being forced to keep up with these binders and, uh, I mean, on a serious note, to keep up with these binders and, you know, plan my schedule out. And, and I'm thinking, where are the results in this? Where am I, where, where, where is this benefiting me at? I, I, don't, I don't understand it. And, and mind you, I was okay with getting by. So that extra encouragement was trying to do my best and they kept pushing me to join that AP class or join that pre-AP class or get that A or get that B. I was tired of hearing it. Because at this time I was arrogant, I was stubborn, and I again thought I knew it all. I thought I knew what was best for me. So my sophomore year, towards the end of my sophomore year, I remember asking Ms. Swim, Ms. Jones Swim, my Abbott teacher, if I go to the council office to change my schedule so I can get out of Abbott. But she wouldn't let me. <laughs> my Abbott family wouldn't let me. Um, it was this time when I considered, my, I considered Ms. Jones Swim to have saved me. She introduced me to the person who would eventually become that thorn on my side, challenged me to, to be better, uh, Ms. Carmen Stewart. She became my mentor. And at that time, she told me the words that I most needed to hear. She told me that it was one thing when you quit believing in yourself, but it was another when those who believe in you most stopped believing in you. It was that time when I decided to make a promise to myself and to them. I promised them that I would make it. And I'm continuing that, that promise today. As mentioned earlier, I'm going into my sophomore year at the University of Texas in San Antonio. I'm one of 10, I'm the first of 10 grandchildren to have entered college. I'm the youngest of two children. I'm the only of those two children to have graduated from high school. My sister being the other did not finish. To sum everything up, what Abbott has done for me has been a blessing in God's good time. It has helped me self-discover. It has helped me discover who I am as a person and all that I can be, if I just set out to be it. I want to take this time to encourage you all to continue to do what you do, because it works. It has worked for me, it has worked for many others, and it has worked for these three unique individuals sitting before, on to my left, Jonathan, Karen, and Fernando. So it does work. I also want to take the time to thank Ms. Carmen Stewart, Ms. Jones Swim, and Mr. Ron Griffin for, for being my savers, for being that extra push that I needed through junior high, through seventh grade, through my senior year, even in my sophomore year of college. I want to thank the Abbott family. I want to thank you all. And uh, God bless.